You're listening to the Undisputed Wrestling Show on the Angry Marks Podcast Network, featuring the bearded wonder Zane Paisley, Sign Guy, Drew Skills, and the Morning Star, William Huckabee. The Undisputed Wrestling Show is now. That's right, baby. It is now. It is Tuesday. It is 9 p.m. Eastern. Thank you all for who's listening live and all you people who downloaded it. We have a great show planned for you tonight. You are rocking with the best. I am Drew Skills, and with me we have the whole full cast tonight. We got Lord Zane Paisley, the bearded wonder. How you doing, Zane? I am doing just fantastic, ready to rock and roll. Right on. Um, we got coming from North Carolina. Usually, we usually use, introduce him last, but I'm introducing him next, and that's the man, the incredible Huck. The morning star, Will Huckabee. How you doing, Will? I'm doing great, man. Let's go ahead and get this party jumping. Right on, my man, because we also have with us as, as a host, we have Kevin Sullivan's very favorite referee. Kevin Sullivan doesn't want to have a match. If he doesn't have this guy, best ref he's ever been in the ring with, from Kevin Sullivan's own lips, you can listen to our archives to hear it. We got sign guy tonight. How you doing, brother? Doing very well tonight, Mr. Skills. Right on. Well, like I said, we have a great show lined up. In the second half of the show, we got my man, Roy Fox, who's going to be on from the MTV. Uh, I want to be a pro wrestler back in the day, that, that special that came out that changed so many uh, perception of professional wrestling, and it was a big deal. And Roy's going to be on. He's going to talk to us on the second half. But right now, we're not going to wait any longer. We're going to bring our first guest right in here. We have none other than gorgeous Teddy Williams, sweet Teddy Williams, sweet William, one half of the dream team. One half of the Kiwis, one half of one of the most brutal tag teams in all of professional wrestling, the Sheep Herders, and one half of the Hall of Famers, the Bushwhackers. We got Bushwhacker Luke. How you doing, sir? Let his love you tell you mad that night. And we got some thunder from down under coming your way tonight, mate. <laughs> yes, yes, my brother. Uh, you know, of course, people who watch the Hall of Fame, they got to hear a lot about you, Luke, and we uh, we like our listeners to get a little bit of a background on the guys that we bring in, our, our, our special guests like you tonight. If you don't mind, tell us a little bit about back in the day uh, when what your passion for this business and kind of what got you started back in New Zealand. Well, I didn't ever even I didn't even know about the business, mate. My my main, my next door neighbor was a bodybuilder, and um, he went in the Mister New Zealand contest, and. Um, he did, he did well, come, and uh, maybe win, win his, won it or was runner up in that. And the judge of the contest was a uh, ex Mr. New Zealand. Now I'm going right back. This is 1961. And that, uh, and the, 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 uh, one of the judges was Mr. New Zealand 1950. Well, that judge was a wrestling promoter in New Zealand. And that uh, he'd gone from bodybuilding to wrestling and that. And he said to my next door neighbor, who was Bruno Becker, or Brian Ashby, he said to him, well, why not make some money with that body? So uh, Bruno started going into the uh, into the gym, and that, and then, then all of a sudden, you know, within two or three months, he started taking me to, to the gym with him. Now, this gym was like in the first Rocky movie. The pipes were running around the roof, rattling and that. There was a steam room in the back. There was two two rings. There were four ropes, rings, 20 foot in 20 foot between the ropes and the mat and the, and the floor of the rings was just like a hard as the floor in your house. And, then, oh, and there's the, the, the only, in the gym, and in the gym, there's some kettlebells. The only two machines for bodybuilding was a, well, not machines. There was a bench press rack and a squat rack. The rest of them were like kettlebells or, you know, the uh, barbells with the, the bars had set weights on them. You picked up a bar, and it was 25, 30, or 45. It was, you could, there was no bars you could take plates on and off. Everything was set like that. And that was the sort of gym that I was brought up in. This was 1961. Wow. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, getting started there in New Zealand, I know it was a little, it, it's obviously a lot different than uh, getting started here in America. Can you tell us a little bit about the, some of your first matches well, and how well, the differences? Okay, mate, uh, well, and I'll get right to the point here, mate. At the time, we never had TV in New Zealand. We didn't even have wrestling uh, on TV. We didn't even have TV till 1967. 
So everything was on radio. On a Sunday night, we used to sit around the radio and then I listened to soap operas on the radio. So we never, and then all, the, all we had was wrestling magazines from the States. And um, 1965, Jim Barnett came into Australia with WCW. Yeah, you know what, you know who WCW was? Ted Turner bought right. it from Jim, Jim Barnett. Jim Barnett was the, uh, one of the original promoters in North America, well, not the original, but one of them that actually set the wrestling on fire. He was the first guy to, he got Ted Turner to put wrestling on cable, you know, on, on WTBS. And this was in the, in the 70s. But in the 60s, he on coast to coast. He had, a, he had a foot, you know, a part of this territory, part of Chicago, a part of Eddie Graham's territory. He had from coast to coast, and that is, he was a well-known promoter. He, Jim Barnett was gay. He worked for he worked for the Crockers later on in life, and he worked for Vince McMahon. He was a good friend of Vince McMahon seniors and and um, and Stu Hart, and that. But he had uh, he had a great brain for the business. You know, he was a little dapper. He went down to Australia in '65 and. Uh, Within six months or within three months, he had Australia on fire with world uh, world championship wrestling. He, he brought everything in from the states, all the talent in. Used a few of the Aussie boys, as he had kept a couple of them, and but all the rest of them were used as jobs. And he put jobbers, and he bought, and he started doing world championship wrestling, which caught on fire. Killer Kowalski was the first big heel down there. And, and of course, he was the hottest thing in Madison Square Garden in the 60s and early 70s. But Kowalski and the names he brought in there were all the heavy names. Abdullah, you know, at the time, the time they went with heavy American wrestling straight into Australia. And that, that, that caught on fire after watching wrestling, as in wrestling, high spots and ring. And all of a sudden they came in with heavy stuff. Don Morocco was in the 60s, or uh, in the 70s, uh, early 70s. Don Morocco, Rick Martel, and Mark Lewin, they were the main baby faces there, good looking guys. And, you know, Rick Martel was a, a one hell of a uh, hand, you know, he, he changed to the, um, he, to a heel on WWE later on in life. And that, and of course, Don Morocco changed to a heel, but earlier on in his career, you know, the, they were good-looking yeah, uh, guys around 230, 235. So, and um, Mark was a bit heavier. Then they brought in the big heavy artillery as uh, heels. And the place, you know, they had a great managers, great managers down there. And um, well, if I mentioned guys like Buddy Austin, Brute Barnard, Skull Murphy, a lot of the rest of folk don't know who they are. But these were the main heels in the 60s and the 70s. Taz and Tyler, they were names, big names. It sold out arenas all over the states. Of course, everyone that took Jim Barnett took down there were the main guys from all around the country. And that is, anyhow, it's getting back to us. And that butchered me, as you heard in our Hall of Fame. You know, we were in 1965. Peter came back. You know, in 66, wrestling became full time. And six, from 62, when I started to 66. I'd only wrestle when American or British Euro or European wrestler came in and they would come in for about three months and um work two or three shows a week, two shows a week, stay and wait till the next week and that promoter would keep them and that and um and they'd work she work two or three shows a week for you know, maybe two months and leave. Sixty six wrestling became full time in New Zealand and we were running six to seven days a week. And that's when Barney was running in Australia every day a week, of course. And then we started New Zealand, but on a much smaller scale. We'd only have one overseas guy in at a time, and we'd all the rest would be locals. The main event would be um, eight, eight-minute rounds. I'm talking about four ropes still and rounds, eight, eight-minute rounds, and the uh, semi-final match would be eight, five-minute rounds. So and and, well, and earlier on in my career, right up to intermission, you see amateur wrestling, you know, and then they used to only have three main, three pro, 
three program uh, matches. It was uh, a big change, you know what I mean? And all of a sudden, we dropped the amateurs and we in '66, and we went full time, you know, with five matches a night. I know you've uh, I've, I've talked to you before uh, about the round system and things of that nature, and and how different that was. And you guys didn't even used to be able to throw uh, punches and kicks without the police trying to stop that, it. Isn't that correct? Yeah, exactly. That correct. You know the the uh, police used to come and run. Everyone had to have a permit. The promoter would have to put the names he had, the real names of the rest of the he had coming into the town. That would be forwarded to the, the police uh, commissioner in that town, and they would go over the names to see that no one had a criminal record. And that had to be cleared two or three weeks before the show was promoted. And that it was promoted on the radio and with posters. And... Um, that the police would come to the, the, the arena that night. They would measure that it was 20 feet between the ropes. They would check that all the ropes were secure and walk around the ring. The police, now this is, and um, they would be there too. And the, and the rules too. You couldn't stomp, kick or stomp, and you couldn't, um, and you couldn't throw a punch. <laughs> and the police were like the commission, you know, the, those days <laughs> and that. They would tell the, they would tell the referee, they would come up, if anything happened like that in the match, and that, you get a warning, and then the next minute, the, the match would be stopped. You get be wow. queued, you'd be disqualified. It was, it was strange. It wasn't too, and the round system, too. You know, six, six minute early matches were five, five minute rounds, you know, six, five minute rounds, and then, and then the main event was eight, eight. The main event didn't go any less than six. The people would boo the house out. They they wanted to see at least forty five minutes of the main event. Fifty minutes. Typically, you know, the, if you, typically the mains sorry, were uh, tags. Is that is that right? The tag it was usually singles, and then they would come back with a tag match in the main. Yeah, originally, originally too. Butch and me would work as you know. We were in the, when we were on the road in the smaller towns. We would work in. Um, we were in the first half. I would do a single match with one with one guy, and Butch would do a single match. And then after the mission, would come back with a tag against the same two guys we had in singles. Right on. And we didn't even those days. Those days we didn't even do angles to get you know to, to uh, set set it up. Like if I worked a single, and then um, the and I, I was a heel, and. Um, the baby face is making a comeback, which would come in, you know, later on, and it, which would come in and it would both beat up on that baby face. And then the other baby face would run in and then, and then we'd take a powder and then we'd come back and we'd do a promo and come back after the mission. Nothing like that was done in those days. Getting back to my first match, you know, mate, the first time, the second time I ever been to a wrestling show, a, a wrestling show, second time I ever been to one. The, one of the guys didn't arrive, and next minute I got thrown a pair of boots. I had on a pair of jeans, and they said, and threw me a tank top, and I was in the ring. I don't remember <laughs> anything of that match. That was my first time. Wow. Yeah, I, never, that, I don't even remember that. You know, it was, it was a blur to me. I bet. That's definitely getting thrown into the walls. Yeah, but then after that, I got the taste of it, and that, and that, and Hence, um, Sweet William. It was gorgeous Teddy Williams at the start, and uh, we we cut it short to Sweet William. And then, I, and then I had a, I used to have a male valet. I had a female valet first, and that who I used to, you know, at the time she'd be dressed in it uh, was a, you know, like like the girls and uh, what what can you call it now? The clubs back in the sixties. Yeah, anyhow, yeah, she was dressed still- in a tight little. Yeah, like no, in the sixties. Disco um, shooting. Anyhow, yeah, anyhow, she be dressed like a penthouse from the sixties, like that. And um, I used to, she'd come in and spray the ring and uh, spray the ring and and spray it. And I would grab her and slap her around and say, you know, she wasn't doing the right. Like, she wasn't doing <laughs> the right in the fancy street because she. I always had a good looking girl, and that'd be hot. I'd have heat without even my opponent coming to the ring. It's just because I treated my valet right, you know, badly, you know. Uh, she was running around trying to be the best and that, and I was 
And anyhow, they were the early heel days, Sweet William. And then when Butch started in 66, you know, he started in 66, and we st- we started doing singles and just teamed up like that. It wasn't until 68 that we started being full-time at the tag team and going to Singapore and Bangkok and all that sort of stuff. And then, you know, 71, we made the big move, and that, and we came to, we, we, we worked it all up in the Far East, in Japan and all that. In 71, that's where we made the big move. The Vachons, they owned a t- company called Grand Prix, and that, and they um, brought us over to um, was out of Montreal. The company, the company ran three towns a night. I'm, j- I'm jumping ahead in the story. While I was in Australia, I met you know Killer Kowalski. I met a lot of American wrestlers, a lot of big names, you know, because they were wrestling over in Australia. And Butch and me used to go to Australia to do jobs for a couple of weeks and come home. So I met a lot of Americans and that wrestlers. So when we first come, uh, and of course, Andre, well, Gene Perry, he had come and worked as um, the giant. He had come and worked in New Zealand when it was full time. So Butch and me had worked all around the country for two two or three months with him in every town, every main town a few times, and all the little spot shows and that. So when we came to Montreal, the main hill was Killer Kowalski, and the main baby face was the Andre the Giant. So we, when we arrived there straight away, we 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 used the two top guys. And this company was running three towns a night. And the Rougeos, if you remember who the Rougeos are, Jock Rougeau was in WWE. Sure. It was Raymond as the Rougeos, and then they were the Mounties. You know, Jock was the Mounties in here. They, they had, their dad had a company. Their uncle and their dad had a company. And that, that we will work for the Vachons. Morris and, Morris, who was Mad Dog Vachon, and Paul, who was Butcher Vachon. They're the ones that brought us to the side of the world. That's and awesome. that was our we, first we did, territory. Your first Sorry. territory was with, with Grand Prix? Oh, you're fine, brother. Uh, we're, this is the, un, the Undisputed Wrestling Show on Angry Marks Podcast Network, and we're talking with Hall of Famer Bushwhacker Luke and, and Luke, you were just you talked about how you guys did some Singapore and Asia, and I've I've heard the story about you having to slick your hair back, vaseline it back just to get in the country uh, and put a hat on. They, they were trying to clean up the country. Is that right? Yeah, that, 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 you know, at the moment, if you go to Singapore, you can't chew gum. If you get caught chewing gum and spit it out on the street, there's fines, heavy fines, and cigarettes in the street and all that. There's heavy fines. Well, back in those days, they were they were trying to clean up Singapore, and, and it was called Malaysia. It wasn't. It was called. I mean, Asia. It wasn't the, as it is today. You know, you leave Singapore and to go up to Bangkok, you go to Penang or Kuala Lumpur, you know, you, you, and then up to Bangkok and that. And that was. It was all at the time the war was going on, and that you could. We would we would drive up through the jungle at night, and you could hear the guns. Was a, there was a curfew at five o'clock. <laughs> we being foreigners and, and and idiots, we drive up through past curfew time, drive up through the um, through the countries, going up to Benang and to Kuala Lumpur, and um, you could hear the machine guns in the background. Right a tat tat in the jungle, crazy, huh? Young and crazy. <laughs> for I got sure, a lot of stories sure. I can tell. I get a lot of stories I can tell about in those sort of places, but they're not for the ears because if kids are listening, it's not for their ears. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I'm, I'm going to pass it around. I know uh, some of the other hosts have some great questions for you as well, Luke. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to Sign Guy. Sign Guy, what do you got for Bushwhacker Luke Williams? Well, first of all, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, my first question for you I am up here in the Pacific Northwest where you and Butch are legends still having wrestled for Don Owens for quite a while. What was it like working for someone with the reputation of Don Owens? Well, Don Owens, it was funny. We were working in Hawaii in in about 1978, and Roddy came over to a show there, and um, he was working with Don. And Buddy Rose and him both came over there to work a show in Hawaii. And um, we were living in there at the time, thinking, well, great. 
that's not the game we're right. Because we'd be, we worked and we worked for Stu. After Grand Prix, we worked for Stu Hart. So we worked in territories. Then we went home to New Zealand to to open up TV, Western TV. Then when we we came back to Hawaii, and and Roddy came in and then and he says, well, you know, we're a tag, we're sort of a tag team. The main tag team has left, and that is we called Don Owen straight away on the phone there. Well. Right there on the, from the arena, the big arena where the show was, I talked to Don Owens. Next minute, we were in. We went to Japan and we came back and we're straight into the Northwest. And we worked with Don. We worked with Roddy Piper and Rick Martell for over um, a year, going from single, going from tags to six man tags. Because we formed an army with Buddy Rose. We always have a mirror. We always have an American. With a, carrying a flag and that, and we had Buddy Rose as our general, and there's two, us two Kiwis, and, and they would, um, it was R- Ronnie and Rick Martell as the, ba- the baby faces, and they would bring in, when we went in the six mans, they'd bring in Jesse Ventura, they'd bring in an Andre, they'd bring different names to be in the six mans and that. So, we yeah, had one thing, I, I never knew this till Ronnie told me, Two months before he passed away, that we had twenty six, I think, twenty five consecutive sellouts in 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 Portland, and that was was on the, We had a hell of a run there. Just we just had we had the chemistry, and we did so much stuff that we bring in and, and just going back into tags and and it was uh, Buddy and Roddy would study the um, the show afterwards and see what the fans liked. And you see, they'd always make a swerve, to think of uh, the, the best swerve, and we'd do it. So we got them back each week. And Don, Don owned his own arena. It was a big Albertsons or something or other, whatever it was. And, uh, and he had uh, bleachers on wheels. So depending on how many advanced tickets he'd had, he put the rows down. You know, you'd go up to 10 rows on the floor, then you'd, you'd push the bleachers back on wheels. And that was a one hell of a setup. Max, Max, I'd say then was 2,500 to 3,000. Max, 2,500. But to do those days, to have to, you know, in the 70s, to have 25 because they're going to sell out in the same building, that's what, that's what hell of a. He shot down that. Sorry. Sorry, I. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Great. Yeah, business. so that was, that was great working. And there's a lot of stories from that territory, mate. Road stories. If you listen to the Roddy, Roddy, um, Piper's podcast with me, I did two, about a year before he died, I did two podcasts with him. Nine months before he died, I'd say. And then and we had, you know, we had a big, uh, 200, 200 listeners, 250,000 listens or something rather. And, um, it was, we told you the, yeah, the the back side of the territory, not 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 the ring side. What happened behind the scenes, and that was one hey, Luke. one damn territory with a lot of stories. Hey Luke, did you guys did you guys talk at all about Elton? Yes, sir. Elton's the man. Elton's the promoter that shot himself with his uh, Christmas crackers, his his um, testicles. <laughs> he used to get drunk every night. Uh, for instance, we're in the ring. You know, he ran the, he ran the, uh, Southern Town for his brother. He didn't even, he lived in the, a hundred yards or about his home was 50 yards to a hundred yards away from his brother's on the far, on the turkey farm. And he didn't even know his, who his champions were. He ran, you know, the TV was every Saturday night and it would be, we'd be with Elvin on a Monday. Uh, and he would come to dress him, who's my damn champion this week? And then, He'd drink all night and that, and um, he, he was he was a nut. There's a lot of stories in that. If you listen to that tape and that, um, he he was so drunk this night that he came out and he had the money in one hand and he was and he had a little gun in his other hand because he used to take the money to the car. And he put his hand in the wrong pocket, pulled the trigger, and the bullet went out from one of those small two twenty two pistols and went into his testicles. Oh man, yeah. You know, we'd be in the ring, and I just, with, and at the end of the show, we're doing an in-house angle, like handcuff 
Ricky go running to the corner post and start beating up and that. And he, he, the fans would, he'd always be at the end of the show, he'd be sitting at the door with, because with his cup, it was one of those clear cups, he didn't know whether it was vodka or gin, and then he was sipping away, and he liked all the fans to say, what a hell of a show, Elton, hell of a show, thank you, thank you. Well, the, well, the times we did angles, the fans used to come run back and tell him, and he would wander up to the ring, hop in the ring, all drunk at that, Hand me the mic, and he say, "I find you five thousand. I find you for ten thousand, and all that sort of stuff." So you take the heat right off the angle. Anyhow, this night, which was so fed up with it, he came into the ring drunk like this, and that, and, and Butch told me grab him from behind, and Butch grabbed the belt and came and and hit him with a working with a working whack for the belt. But it hit Elton, Elton went down, his toothpaste slid off, his glasses went to the floor out of the ring, and, um, the, and it went out of the ring, it went out of the ring, and, um, he, and he went down there, and we grabbed the bottle and went back to the dressing room. That night, we always used to line up and go and get paid. You know, he'd, he'd have the 20s, the 10s, the 5s, and the 1s, and he would look at where you were in the car and peel them off and, you F around with you, how you paid you. This night, no one would want to go in to get paid. And in the end of 15 minutes, Butch said, F it, I'll go in first. So he went in first. Susie walked in the door of the back room there. She told him, well, a hell of a job you do. A hell of a job you did. And he said, next time, I'll get Luke to hold you. But when you, when um, I come to hit you with the bell, Luke will push you down. You'll duck, and I'll take Luke. And he said, Oh, that's a hell of a bloody idea. Hell of an idea. And he used to, and he said, Here's, here's ten dollars, uh, for good attitude. And then that's a, and then we all came in and got paid. He had to beat him to the punchline. He was, he was, he was such a, a mark. He had a shooter's trophy. I don't know whether you heard about the, the shooter's trophy. No, Did you hear about it? Oh, no. no. Elton always he had a shooter's trophy. So if you came into the territory, you looked like you'd been an amateur. He'd be one of the boys that he knew was an amateur, and you'd go and he'd get you to shoot with the guy for the first minute or two minutes. The referee, you'd tap, you'd lock up as amateurs. The referee, you'd tap you on the shoulder, and then you'd go back, and then you'd lock up as pros. And in that minute shoot, or two minutes shoot, he'd be leaning on the apron with his head under the bottom rope, frothing at the mouth. And the boys used to, uh, the boys used to, um, set, you, you get to, so you'd start 25 for the winner, 15 for the loser. That's $40. So that's on top of your pay. So the boys would split it and get, get 20 each. The referee was, in, he thought the referee was serious, but the, the referee was in on the work. So the boys used to work it and he used to rush back and say, I think Paul got it over Peter, blah, blah, blah. So if he said, I think Paul got over Peter, we'd all say, oh, no, I think Peter had, Peter had more control of, of Paul. He was always opposite. So when the boys got back, he, he says, I don't know, but all the boys just agree with me. I think we should have it again. So the boys would up their price. It would go up from 25, 15 to, um, Maybe forty twenty, <laughs> and work him. And he had this shooter's trophy too. The trophy. Uh, uh, Elton was unreal. He thought it was a real shoot. Blah 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 blah. Uh, you know the boys used to get some colour in that and hit the red. Come back and say the hard, the hard way. Elton, they'd give you twenty dollars extra or thirty dollars extra for colour. <laughs> he was insane. And one night we had fucking uh, uh, one of the. Martello or thing, uh, lot of time, time uh, handcuffed down and um, put the boot to him, and everyone was throwing drinks into the ring, throwing drinks, their drinks into us. His, his second wife, who was a drunk too, came into the ring while the match was still on, and that was a mop and a pail, and started mopping up the ring while we're in the ring working. We just put a hold on the other guy, we just put him in the corner, sat on him, and that. While well, she mopped the ring up and got out the ring, and we carried on with the match. Fuck it. <laughs> this is this is how this is Don Don had turned over his grave. This was happening in Elton's side of the territory. Definitely. You well, heard about I, uh, 
there's a lot of stories I can tell you about in the, in the locker rooms that I did to him, but, um, you know, I don't want to go that deep. But you can go to that. You can go to Ronnie Piper's, um, one with, with Bushwhacker Luke number one and number two, and you can hear a lot of stuff that happened in this territory. And in, and in, um, when we first all, we all went down to, um, from then on, we all went, Jimmy Snooker went first down to NWA and Crockett's out of North Carolina. That was the head, you know, that was the biggest territory in the country. This was before Vince Sr. This was when Vince Sr. had New York. But uh, the Crockett's had the biggest territory. Vince Jr. Vince Jr. turned that, that around when he came in. But earlier on, they had, they ran all over the place. The Crockett's ran the North, the South Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, Atlanta, you know, and they, parts of Florida, they, they covered a big area. And, um, we all went down there and we told a lot of stories about road stories there too. But the most road stories were, you know, from, from, um, the Portland Territory. When we were there, these are the names that were in there. Jimmy Snooker, Buddy Rose, Roddy Piper, Rick Martell, Cowboy Ron Bass, Jesse Ventura was coming in and out, A.D. Adonis, and that. We, this was just the, the crew that was in there, and we all went to Vince. You know what I mean? Some of Absolutely. us via, some of, some of us via Crockett, you know, NWA on Turner Network, and the other ones via Vern. But we all went, we all ended up for working for Vince. Well, Luke, I want to pass things over to one of our other co-hosts. I could talk to you about Northwest Wrestling for hours and hours. I want to pass you over to Will Huckabee. Will! <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, is it Wilbur? Wilbur! No, no, it's just Will. <laughs> it's a, one of the Flintstones. Oh, yes. Um, but my, my, I only have really one question I really need to ask. Um, because I'm younger than most of the other hosts and stuff on the panel and everything. So I became a fan back in the 80s when you were working for WWE. And then once I got into the business and learned the history, that's when I learned about you and Butch's history and stuff as the sheep herders. Uh, but one thing I've noticed with athletes and people in general from uh, New Zealand is that, you know, you're very aggressive, uh, a lot of pride and stuff, and especially, you know, things like your national rugby team and everything. Um, my, my question is this. Having the reputation that, that you and Butch had of being one of the most violent and, and, and aggressive tag teams um, in professional wrestling, uh, how was it working in, in not only Memphis but in the Carolinas for Jim Crockett and stuff where uh, the wrestling was more about stories and, and gimmicks and characters and not so much about the physicality? Yeah, well, we, we get that. You know, we were brought up with a lot of uh, wrestlers from overseas and then and, um, we were... We learned to work, you know, the high spots and all that sort of stuff. And plus, the aggressive side. You know, we've been around Abdullah and, <laughs> and that sort of crew, the, 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 the Fuji and Tanaka yeah, from the 70s, the Japs, which they, they wrestled. They were rugged and rough wrestlers, too. But we learned to, to, to we were just rough houses. And then, and, and all of a sudden, the, you know, we were, we were put in territories where it was blood and guts, and then we adapted to that very easy. But with Crockett, Crockett was just a violent team, you know, not over violence, but we tagged a lot and just kept on. When we healed, we kept on people. One thing, we had the New Zealand flag, and we were foreigners, and we pushed that down people's throats. That you know, we're from a country with three thousand. Three million people, where you have a, a hundred, uh, uh, three hundred million, and we just pushed it down. Had Americans that got so soft with air conditioning cars, air conditioning homes, and air conditioned women, and we, we just we just pushed it down the throats of that. And in a lot of territories, not not NWA because that covered a lot of territories, but the other territories like Memphis and all the other territories, Texas. And Florida, we always did. We came in for six weeks doing television. We didn't, wasn't, didn't have to get our hands raised in television because a lot of times 
when they hit, we were put in the ring first, and the baby faces came to the ring. We jumped down and beat them up and got DQ'd before the match was, you know, we just, we got DQ'd. And then, uh, usually four to six weeks, we'd take a, we'd take a, a map of the state line to, to, to do a promo, and we'd do it in the, in a latrine, in the, in the toilet or something like that, and we'd tell them that this was the latrine of the, of the states. Whatever state we're in, like Texas and that, well, that was the latrine of the state. In other words, the shit house of the country, and that, and would push that down the toilet with the New Zealand flag, or flush it. And of course, promoters would say they'd come in and say, "We're not having you in the territory. This is you're going overboard." You know, they come out to fire us, and then one of the baby faces would step up and say, "Hey, firing is too easy for us." Let, let, let us kick their ass out of the territory. Hence the angle began. <laughs> we did that, and we did that in most territories. We, you know, a lot of territories, the, the, uh, we, we had a promoter who was the commissioner come in the ring and that, and, um, and the ring and tell us that we were fired uh, and that, and, and we didn't take it. We turned around and beat him up and, and they usually 60, 70 year old yeah. guys. And that, and there was a little color, and uh, they'd be carrying out a stretcher. And then the owner would come up and say, You're fired. And then that's when the baby faces would step in and say, You do that the too easy way. And the anger would start. And we did that, and we, you know, we did that in Jerry Jarrett's territory. We did that in the Fuller's territory. We did that in Joe Blanchard's territory. But a lot of these territories, I was a booker. In the house, border of the Volca. So we did the same thing in most territories. Uh, my, my last question yeah. before I pass, my, my last question is, is this, um, <clears throat> because I've got to ask, going from being, you know, the, the ultra-violent sheep herders uh, to the bushwhackers in, in WWE, uh, how did you feel about it when, they first, when, when Vince first approached you uh, with the gimmick and stuff? <laughs> hey, we were professionals. If, you know, Vince, he, he looked at us, he says, to us, uh, he says, how would you guys like to be baby faces? And Butch jumped up on his desk and I said, we didn't actually say it was in front of Vince, but Butch came up on the, Vince's desk and his nose was about a foot, maybe 18 inches away from Vince. He says, if you can make these faces baby faces, go <laughs> ahead. And Vince turned around, Vince turned around and says, look at the noggins on my top baby face. Look at Hogan. Look at Jake. Look at Axel. They haven't got the prettiest months. And that. And, he <laughs> says, and then, then he says to us, and then he says to us, you know, I want you to be, be between the moon dogs and the sheep herders. I want you to be the, between the baby faces, but the sheep herder style, see the moon dogs. And that, now the moon dogs have been on USA Network for, for five years doing their healing shit. The sheep herders have been, we'd been on and off TBS and we're right on before, you know, we'd been from 1980, 79, we'd been on TBS when we went to Crockett's. I think in 1980, we went to Crockett's and, uh, and, um, we've been on and off in, you know, TBS, WTBS. And at the time we just finished with the Rock and Roll Express and we, we, we just, we'd done an angle with Lex Luger and Barry Windham. And that's where we got the call from Vince. So we, 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 uh, we, uh, were sort of hanging, gang ho and butch said to us, well, you know, we've been the sheep herders there and we've been the, um, and the moon dogs have been here. He said, let's create something completely different. They gave us the name when we came home three days, three days later. We came home three days later. We got contracts in the mail saying, the butch wife, because the butch rings me up and says, hey, I've got a contract here, but they, they sent it to the wrong people. <laughs> and I says, no, they haven't. That's us. They did straight away changes to the butch wackers. And then, and, well, um, that's how it came and that, and, and we did, and then he never gave us the gimmick or anything. We came up with the arm swinging and that was, and the, and the head licking. We always swung if you watch Turner's network in the end. I was healing and that. We always went, we always went out in the ring and uh, onto the floor and swung our arms up in the air and you went, whoa, yay. We always, we always did that as heels too. 
you know, swing our arms up at the rub by the rails to spear the fans and go, whoa, yay. And then, and then, and then, which is, and then swing and go into the ring. And of course, I bitched at the start as if my shoulders are already shot. He said, and Butch says, <laughs> you want to make bloody money? <laughs> he said, you want to make bloody money? And then the little head licking and that. And then I always put my hand on their head and licked the back of my hand. And that's how we started. We changed and we worked out. The gimmick took us about a week to put together. We started with Vince going to the ring, swinging our arms. But we weren't in unicorn. You know, unison like we were. It took us a week to get the gimmick together with Vince. Of course, we did we did um, vignettes for about six weeks for Vince, so flying up there every week and doing two vignettes a week. You know, three vignettes and then coming back. And that's what he saturated the, the you know the U.S. and Europe with bushwhacker vignettes. I don't know if you remember any, but you know, Crocodile Dundee was hot at the time, and we copied a lot of his stuff. You know, not not actually him, but the different things, you know, on the wrong side of the road, and, you know, they would never seen a Coke machine, drinking machine, a lot of different things. We did vignettes in, 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 um, in diners, and they gave us knife and forks, and we threw them to the floor and said, if we don't need these, and fit ourselves with our hands, and all sorts of dead, crazy shit. But that all, all that crazy shit helped us make the sheep herd, the bushwhackers. With, with, with that being said, I'm going to pass it on over to uh, the bearded wonder, because I know he has some excellent questions for you. Uh, Zane, what do you have for bushwhacker root? Well, this is the, the bearded right? wonder. Ah. You know, you know, I used to I used to be a sheep shearer before I became a sheep herder. Oh no, I better stay away from you yeah. then. <laughs> yeah. Well, How you doing, the- mate? I'm doing fantastic. This is the Undisputed Wrestling Show on the Angry Marks Podcast Network. We are talking with WWE Hall of Famer, Bushwhacker, Luke Williams. Uh, Luke, you had mentioned... Whoa! Whoa! Uh, you had mentioned earlier about your great um, episode of Piper's Pit podcast uh, with the late, great Roddy Piper. Do you remember a caller calling in and asking about uh, who deserved to go into the WWE Hall of Fame that hadn't been there yet? Yeah, we had a few people. Yeah, it was, yeah. Well, get, I, don't, I don't remember, but yeah, yeah. let's get to well, the uh, meat. Well, that that was me, and I had no idea that the Bushwhackers were getting ready to uh, to join the WWE Hall of Fame at that point. When you recorded the podcast, uh, did you uh, have any inclination that they were going to uh, induct you that year? Well, what year? What time? What month was this now? Uh, it was when you uh, recorded uh, Piper's Pit, so it was probably uh, January of 2015, um, maybe a little bit earlier, yeah, maybe yeah, December. Yeah, see, yeah I got, no, I got, I, at the end of January, they told us. Okay, so it was right before. That was, I don't know, I, I, I had uh, talked with Roddy uh, in February of that year, right after they announced that you guys were in it, so uh, he and I said that you, I deserved at least partial credit for you guys getting in, so. You're welcome, I guess. That was um, a lot of people. A lot of people saw us, and that, and they, we were not to, on the on the social media. We were not to pieces because they thought we were only being in WWE. A lot of the fans today, they said, "How come these two goons, you know, you know, just clowns into the ring?" They didn't know. <laughs> At one time, I did flying head scissors. I did drop kicks. I did <laughs> wrestle. I wrestled all technical. You know. I, I learned British style. Even though I was a heel, I was and worked, worked as a fag. I worked all, you know, you know the uppercuts and you know Cesario does. You know the uppercuts of the Cesario. Yes, Cesario. You know yeah. Talking about the uppercuts, I, that's yeah. all I used to do. Those and forearms. Yeah. You know, I'd run in with those, those, those things. I could tell me I couldn't do one now, but I used to wait, give him, kick the guy. Uh, you know, when he's bending over, run into him and catch him, give him one of those. So I did all that sort of stuff. And the crucifix, you put a guy in, the t- in, a, 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 in a top wrist lock and you jump up and you grab his other uh, arm from behind with the uh, with your leg scissors and you, he falls back and you pin him. Like that sort of shit. I did all that. It was, when I think of it now, it sounds crazy you doing it, but 
That's the way I was brought up, British wrestling. And it was either side, left side, right side. Well, uh, you just mentioned that that being a clown in the WWE, you are literally a clown uh, when they had the four doinks at the uh, uh, yeah. Survivor Series. Uh, what what was that experience like? Did did Vince just come up to you and said, "Hey, you're going to be uh, everybody in on this team is is going to be dressed up like Doink"? Yeah, yeah. Hey, mate, we're we're true pros. You know, you do. Hey, you do what makes money, and so we're all Doinks. And the, and I had to throw in the slip on the banana skin. Says you might as well <laughs> slide in a banana skin. <laughs> well, uh, I know that. Uh, are you uh, down in Clearwater right now? Yeah, I'm on Clearwater Beach, mate. Um, it's been 90, 90 degrees today. Last uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it was, Monday, it was crazy here. Yeah. Been Memorial Day. Everybody was down. You know, it was like it was like spring break. It was that crazy. Maybe crazier. Well, well, tell us about uh, Bushwhacker Luke's Clearwater Beach Fitness down there. Yeah, if, if you're down... If you're down in Clearwater, mate, we're on, on Mandalay Avenue. I'm right above Hulk Hogan's beach shop. He's got, he's got a beach shop with all of his memorabilia from day one to the present. He's got all Hulk Hogan, got all WWE stuff and all the Hogan stuff. And I'm upstairs with the Clearwater Beach Fitness. And if you go to the website or to Google, you'll see clearwaterbeachfitness.org or Bushwhackers, Bushwhacker Luke's Clearwater Beach Fitness. If you go to the top gyms in the, sta- in the uh, Clearwater area, it, it comes up as an old. I'll come up on top. I'm an old school gym, but it, everything goes. You know, it's got a good crew in there, and you, you, quite often you you get signing with the celebrities in there. Well, and I think one of the cool things is uh, you don't have to be a local to go down there. Uh, if uh, our listeners are visiting, which that's a beautiful area anyway. But uh, they can uh, get either daily or weekly gym passes there, so you don't have yep. to do a big membership. You can just go and mm-hmm. and uh, work out with the best right there. And as the most of our business is from tourists, mate. Yeah. Well, and also yeah. when I was at uh, Hogan's Beach, they also had uh, Bushwhacker T-shirts available there too. Yes, that's correct, mate. That's correct. Well, and any more can... questions, mate? In, any more questions? Well, I was just going to say, uh, I know that you're still uh, very active on the independent circuit. Do you have any big events coming up soon? Well, I'm supposed to be leaving for for London uh, on Thursday, but I haven't got a work visa yet. The guy, Uh-oh. the company, the, I told them, I, they said, oh, it was a letter of intent and you have your visa there when we land. And I, I've already been through that before. I've been turned around and sent back to back to the States. So um, I... I, I'm uh, I'm not leaving. I don't leave port now until I have the visa, a copy of the visa sent to me. Well, how can uh, our listeners follow what you're doing uh, on your social medias? Well, your social media and that. Well, I made. I've got a new website coming out. It's been it's been on hold for a year because I've been working on the gym and the gym side of things and that. But on the new website, will be coming out and that. At the moment, I've just got bushwhacker.net, but I, I don't actually do anything. It hasn't, it hasn't been updated for like a year or so. It's just on, I usually, I, on my uh, Bushwhacker Luke, um, Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. I usually put what I'm doing on that. Excellent. Well, before we let you go, what do you have to say to your fans? Uh, well, uh, wherever I'm going, mate. Come in and see me. I want to shake your hand, and you might get a head licking. I'm looking <laughs> forward to still. I, I, I'll admit that my age. I'm still traveling around the still traveling around the country. I'm traveling around Europe, and uh, you know I've got a, a couple of years left in me here to entertain the people. So hope you all come down wherever I'm appearing and see me and and say you you just say I listen to you on. The, the, this network on this podcast. What's the name of it again, mate? The Undisputed Wrestling Show on the Angry Marks podcast. The Undisputed, yeah. And you can ask me about my times. A lot of stuff I never covered here. A lot of my trips in South America and in Puerto Rico, and that where I had some of the wildest things, fire matches, and, and Bill Watts' territory. You know, I, 
we were doing fire matches in the 70s. When Bill was in the 80s, I did 37 barbed wire cage matches. The cage was built out of barbed wire. And that with the, with the, with the Fantastics. One of them now is upstairs, Tommy Rogers. These were two little guys with hearts, fighting hearts. And then, you know, there's the, the people we work with around the country with the fabulous ones. The, uh, these were before the WWE. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of them. And wherever I went, and then uh, when I was booker, a lot of territories, I took the same crew with me because we proven we could draw one area. So we, I, I moved the crew with me to the next area, the next area. And my, my crew for Texas and that and Puerto Rico was always, I always had an Abby and Bruiser Brody. That was the main event and a lot of the places when we had the big shows and that. And, um, of course, Stan Hansen was with Bruiser and a lot of them and that. And, um, and, uh, and we it was always put to me and, and in Texas we had Dickie Murdoch who's upstairs now. God bless him. And Manny Fernandez, we had a Mexican and a Texan, uh, a real redneck Texan, Dick Murdoch, who drew a lot of money with those two. I even ran into Ivan Putsky at, 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 Wrestle, at WrestleCom and that. And I remember working, he's from Austin, Texas. Remember uh, Ivan Putsky? Oh, yeah, definitely, the Polish sure. Hammer. The Polish Hammer, yeah. Boy, that I ran into him, I hadn't seen them for... A lot of these people, when I'm at these conventions, I haven't seen them for 25 years. Same well, as Puerto Rico. In Puerto Rico ran, ran with the, uh, the invaders for so long, and with Carlos Cologne and the invader, Carlos Cologne and many people. You know, we worked in, in big sellouts and ballparks in the, in the 70s and 80s. Well, uh, Luke, I'm going to pass it back over to uh, Drew Skills to finish up with you. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome, mate. Well, hey, Luke, I just want to thank you for coming on tonight. I want to thank you for the knowledge that you've passed along to me in locker rooms and cars and and all the great stuff that I've learned from you as well. It was an honor to to share the ring with you uh, last year. and I look forward to seeing you again. I just want to thank you for coming on tonight and sharing your story with us. I I hope I didn't bore the fans. I hope I didn't bore your fans tonight, mate. Oh, no, not at all. We probably, this is going to be one of the biggest downloaded shows, I'm sure. I uh, hope you say so. uh, I could tell some of the behind the scenes stories, but I don't know how what your age group is, you know, and I don't know how far to go, but and there's a lot of stories. It may, maybe another time, mate. For sure. And, and again, we appreciate you coming on, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Hope to see you soon down the road. And all the fans out there, I'm going to give you the last. Whoa, yay! <laughs> yes, thank you, my brother. What do you think, guys? Bushwhacker Luke on with us tonight? That was tremendous. That was fun, right? Great guy. I, I mean, literally, we could talk to him for five hours. We, we, yeah, he he mentioned at the end, you know, we didn't even really talk to him about Puerto Rico. He's got such a long and distinguished career that, uh, yeah, we could have talked to him forever. Most definitely. Most definitely. Is it? The, is, is it is it that time zone? Do we have a little time to do your uh, your the new episode that you uh, introduced last week? Well, let me, let me set it up again. Uh, this is the Undisputed Wrestling Show on the Angry Marks <laughs> Podcast Network, uh, where you can find all the best podcasts about professional wrestling and mixed martial arts. You can do that by going to www.angrymarks.com backslash podcasts. Um, I also uh, go on to uh, my podcast app on my Apple machine, and uh, I search keyword Angry Marks, all one word, Angry Marks. I hit the subscribe button, then it's fed directly to my phone. Uh, every day there's a, a new uh, episode going on. Obviously, uh, Tuesday nights we record the Undisputed Wrestling Show, so that's loaded on Wednesday afternoons. Uh, lots of great shows available through the Angry Marks Podcast Network. Uh, Drew, how do you get yours on your uh, uh, Android phone? Well, I get mine very similar, Zane, but I go to the Google Play Store and get our uh, version of the iPod Play, which is called Double Pod. And then you do the same exact thing. Keyword search Angry Marks, and you're going to be able to do the same thing. Hit that subscribe button. Don't forget to review and rate. 
drop us five stars. Hit that uh, rating button for us, and uh, make sure make sure you leave a comment as well. Let them know that it's the Undisputed Wrestling Show that you uh, you enjoy listening to on the Angry Marks. Lots of great shows on the Angry Marks Podcast Network. Let them know you stopped by because you wanted to hear the Undisputed Wrestling Show. Well, also later in this hour, we've got uh, Rory Fox, which should be a great chat. But Drew's anticipating me get into the Undisputed Game of Thrones show. Highly rated yeah. uh, segment of our episode of our show. Uh, Will be and uh, Sign Guy, have you guys had a chance to watch any yet? No, I haven't watched a single episode yet. <laughs> I have not Roger. either. Although I did Roger. recognize the plug for that show on Monday Night Raw. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, one of the New Day talked about it, right? Yes. Hold the, Hold door. the door. Hold the door. So, uh, so the homework assignment I gave, I, I don't know if, if, uh, Sign Guy or Will will be able to do anything with it. They might get an incomplete. But Drew, uh, off air, we were talking briefly. Uh, what, what was your theory about, uh, how, uh, pro wrestling can learn from, uh, the Game of Thrones show? Well, I, I think we, uh, go back, uh, to how we talked about with the, contest shows with the scene shows how how young wrestlers uh can to, can take some of those criticisms and apply it to their character to their gimmick and make it better i also think uh in pop culture which uh wwe definitely is a part of uh the whole wwe universe that they can take uh some advice you know and some criticisms and and, and learn different things from shows that are very popular in pop culture and, and one of them that's breaking records and and, uh, you know, as far as views, especially for a paid cable station like, uh, HBO is Game of Thrones. And, uh, the biggest thing that, you know, watching every episode for the last five seasons, the biggest thing I could take away, uh, that they could learn is just organically developing characters and doing switches, baby face to heel, heel to baby organically. Literally in the season right now, uh, you're cheering for a guy, me and Zane was talking about earlier, uh, Jamie Lannister, you're cheering for a guy who pushed a, uh, eight-year-old boy out of a, a freaking castle, uh, to, to seemingly fall to his death, uh, who had incest sex with his sister and killed the king, stabbed the king in the back, uh, just a real piece of shit guy, and now you're rooting for him because they've organically changed him. And, uh, through storytelling have got you to, you know, emotionally invest in this guy instead of, Hey, people like this guy. So, you know, we're going to beat him up at some point and you go save him. So because they like him, they're going to like you too. Or we're going to team you up with this guy this week because they like it. But organically through storytelling, changing how people feel about characters. Well, and they also brought him sympathy by having, uh, his hand cut off, you know, putting oh, yeah, him. Yeah. We'll putting him in peril against great odds. What's that? I said I was more so telling everything he did as a heel, but yeah, those are the things that we can't do. Yes, yes. So, uh, uh, Will or uh, Sign Guy, you guys have anything to add about that? Well, I don't want to get incomplete. <laughs> I have a theory. Uh, over the history of WWE many times they've incorporated aspects from various pop culture phenoms including television shows into what they do I don't know if they want to include something that is maybe not a PG show that would not necessarily have the same demographics into what they do now but if they were to Go PG 13 ish with one of the two shows once they do the brand split and maybe go after a different demographic one of the nights. I could see them incorporating some of the more adult themes from that show into one of the two brands to go after the more adult demographic. Okay, that's an idea. That's an idea. What, what about you, Will? What were you going to say? I was, I was going to say, uh, no, I don't watch the show, but as I said last week, uh, I'm, I'm reading the series. I'm actually reading the books and everything, and I'm halfway through book two. And uh, I can definitely agree with um, with what Drew was saying. It's like, it's all about the storytelling. You know, even in book two, you start seeing 
guys that you, people that you love, the characters that you love in the book one, you really start to question their decisions and who they are as people in book two. Uh, so I definitely can agree, you know, without having to watch a television show and like reading that, the incredible, amazing books, which I recommend anybody do. Um, Drew is 100% correct with that. Excellent. Excellent. All right, guys. Well, so, um, we do have more. One more, such, one more such thing. Just, just on what Son guy was saying. I think, you know, a lot of times they do bring in concepts and they'll do like their version of what's going on on specific things, uh, like the NFL. Uh, spoof they did and, and, the, and the different things, but I'm more so talking about concepts of the show, not necessarily what they're doing in the show, but how they're doing it, how they're explaining the story going, how they're uh, organically coming from one thing to another uh, versus taking a section and, and putting your spin on it. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, and and another thing that's similar to Game of Thrones and uh, professional wrestling. Game of Thrones has a huge universe, so many different characters. So not yeah. every week they're going to be the main event or the headliners. You know, there's going to be guys that are going out there and doing jobs and stuff like that on Game of Thrones. So it shows, uh, you know, one one week somebody can be a minor character. Uh, you know, a perfect example, this past week there was a character that was reintroduced that hadn't been uh, on screen for the past since the third episode ever. And we're now in the sixth season. So you can bring back storytelling. You don't have to uh, think that uh, the viewer is stupid and can't remember what happened two weeks ago. Um, that they, you know, they, they brought back a character that was instantly recognizable that hadn't been on in five seasons. Uh, and you touched on a little bit there, Zane, as well. Not only uh, can you revisit and, and redo those things, but you can take a, a character who's played a smaller role and organically grow that character into a main character. You, you know, Stevie Richards, you know, I always go back to his quote. He says the best, you know, the, the writers only think you're as good as they've wrote you. You know, the things that they've written for you, they think you can't. Uh, achieve more than that. So if they've written you a, a mid card role, which every you know there has to be that, there has to be an opener, there has to be a mid card. So those those roles need to be filled. But if they've written those for you, sometimes they come to the conclusion that that's all you're good for, and they don't you know they don't see you fulfilling roles that you know greater than what they've already put you into. And you know Game of Thrones does a really good job. Of uh, just like you said, one guy in season two may be a small character. By the end of season four or five, he's in running for the throne, you know, and he's making moves and doing doing big things. So I think that's that's a good point as well, Sam. Well, thank you so much. Um, now, guys, uh, we have a few minutes to talk about what what we've done this past week. Um, I want to start with you, sign guy. Uh, how was Piper Palooza? Piper Palooza was phenomenal. Huge crowd there at the North Portland Eagles celebrate Rowdy Roddy Piper and also Kevin Sullivan's first ever match in the state of Oregon. He knocked that out of the park. He is down to the state of Alaska on his 50 states list. So it was uh, Sullivan and uh, the West Side Connection reforming uh, the new Dungeon of Doom? That is correct. They formed... A new Dungeon of Doom. They wrestled in a six-man falls count anywhere match against Dave Havoc Hollenbeck, Aries Toretto, and Petrov. Tree of Woe went for the West Side Connection and Kevin Sullivan. And were you the official? I was the official in charge of officiating that match, yes. And uh, are you still Sullivan's uh, favorite referee? As far as I know, that has not changed. Although that was a bit difficult. You had six bodies. You had a big building. A little bit difficult to be everywhere at once, but I managed it. What do you have coming up this week? Uh, This week, tomorrow night, we have an extremely important VIP guest on Total Dudes. We'll have... Drew Skills is our special guest. Oh, my. And uh, Friday on Sign Guys Wrestling Show, we have, from Ring of Honor, the Beer City Bruiser. From, from uh, Ring of Honor? From Ring of Honor. And uh, 
Saturday and Sunday. I may or may not be down blue collar this Sunday, but uh, definitely the next week for sure. Uh, we're getting ready to bring in yet another former WCW alumni, Chris Youngblood, going to be at blue collar on the 12th. Now, Drew, are you going to be on on Turnbuckle Turmoil or or uh, Total Dudes? I, I'm I didn't catch that. I am very happy to say and honored to be a guest on Total Dudes. Oh my! So you've got to follow uh, Trip Cassidy uh, this week. I'm not worried about it. Okay, make sure to get on the WWE Network so you can get back to uh, Sign Guy. You guys are on season three. Yes, this is the fourth episode of season three we're about to review. Nice. Guy, Guy being such the professional that he is, he uh, sent me a link uh, to the episode that we're reviewing. But as I started to watch it, I remembered that I'd seen this episode, and I have some very uh, clear, fond memories of this episode. So I'm looking forward to that. We're going to have a good time. Well, I can't wait to just listen to Total Dialogue because – I'm, I'm sure that you will do Paige or Summer Ray or someone like that justice. <laughs> Can't wait. So, Drew, what do you have? What did you do this past weekend? Man, uh, I took the weekend off, the holiday off, and uh, hung out with my kids and family, and and just had a good time and gave my body a rest that it needed. And I'm looking forward to uh, to to getting back on the road this weekend. What do you got coming up other than Total Dudes with Sign Guy and Rex? I got Total Dudes. I, I will not forget that. Uh, Wednesday is going to be a big, big lot of fun. Uh, I guess that's tomorrow, ain't it? That's Wednesday. Wow, this week's got me messed up. Uh, and then Friday, I head to Bourbon, Indiana. Uh, and I face the Iron Demon Shane Mercer for the number one contender to the Strong Style Heavyweight Championship, which is currently held by my nemesis, Congo Kong. Big stuff coming up. The Iron Demon is—he's a tough dude. Yeah, he's—he's uh, he's a, he's a real strong guy, man. I, I've watched this guy, uh, you know, kind of kind of come into his own on the Indies, and uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, getting in there and mixing it up with him. It's going to be a lot of fun. And then uh, the following week, man, I'm getting ready to go on vacation to Jamaica. Oh man! Yeah. Going sure on vacation in Jamaica. That's, what's that? I was just going to say, make sure to get some rum and some ugly fruit. Yes. Yes, I will definitely do that. It's going to be a lot of fun. And then I come right back into some indie pop con on the 18th. Uh, they're doing the big invasion show. The soul shooters are taking on the headbangers. Uh, and then on the 19th, I'll have a booth there at indie pop con. So come out and see me here in Indianapolis, Nap town in my hometown here in the circle city. And then, uh, the same week, uh, in the same city, the very following weekend, I got another convention, uh, that I'll be at the Heroes and Legends booth with my good friend, Mean Gene Oakland. Uh, that's 24th, 25th, 26th, and that's the Days of the Dead. So I'll be there, uh, the Days of the Dead for that. Well, I will be there as well, uh, so I will look for you. Uh, should be, should be a fun show. Uh, Will, what'd you do this past weekend? Oh, man. Such a, a packed weekend, man. Um, Saturday, me and my buddy Joe, we um we traveled down to Georgia for the second round of the Wild We Wrestle Tag Team uh tournament. Wild We Wrestle is uh the company that is now running uh where NWA Anarchy and Wildside ran. Of course Drew is very I'm pretty sure Drew is very familiar with the Church of Southern Wrestling. Um, <laughs> Um, and we faced the Hooligans, which was actually a, a tag team that was on my bucket list. Um and it had a really good, cool match with the Hoogans and stuff. We came out on the losing end, um, but it was just uh, incredibly awesome to share the ring with those two guys. Um, and then Sunday, we had the, the big debut for uh, Renegade Wrestling Alliance, or Association Alliance, whatever, and uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Uh, there's several things I've got to say about this show. Is that First of all, um, a lot of people didn't assume or didn't think that uh, the show was going to do very well because of who the owner was. Um, I'm very pleased to say that there was legitimately a packed house, um, almost standing room only. It was a great crowd, a very hot crowd. Um, I, I had a match against the Stro, um, you know, former WCW um, wrestler, the Stro and stuff, came out once again on the lose again. So I think I have a very – I was a loser this whole weekend, it turns out. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> um 
well, yeah, I had, I had a very competitive match with the show, came out on the losing end, but, you know, like I posted on my social media, that there's no shame in losing to a guy in the caliber of the show. Um, but what I, what I also want to say about the promoter um, and the, the actual staff and management team of RWA in Winston-Salem is it was the first time in 10 years um, that when I received my pay, got my, and of course, you know, Drew and Sign Guy, and of course, you do, Zane. You know what I'm talking about. You know, you get your little envelope with your pay in and stuff. Um, so it was the first time in almost 10 years when I received my payout that there was a letter, a legit letter in there uh, saying thank you for being a part of the show. Um, I don't know if a lot of promoters know anything, but, but myself and a lot of the other guys that are on the show was, uh, A, completely taken aback by the fact that this guy actually took time to print out a letter for each of us and stuff, um, saying thank you for being a part of the show and he appreciated us. And uh, we actually went back and told him, like, listen, this is the first time this has ever happened to us. Like, people don't do this. So you might want to stop before you set a precedent that a lot of people can't follow. So, <laughs> <laughs> And that was my weekend. You know, and of course, Monday I uh, cooked out and stuff for the family and and uh, being a former veteran and stuff, the United States military and stuff, you know, I uh, hung out with some, some friends of mine and stuff and reminisced and grilled burgers and drank hot and drank beer and stuff and uh, just had a good time. Okay. Well, and uh, Will, I know that uh, this coming Saturday, you've got a great show um, for the West Virginia Championship Wrestling, uh, and uh, it's in Princeton, West Virginia, and you are the undisputed West Virginia champion. I love that. Topic. <laughs> uh, but it's, it sounds like it's a really good benefit. Can you talk a little about that? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a benefit show for a fan of ours um, <clears throat> who who passed away. So she was uh, the victim of of a robbery in, in her hometown, Princeton, uh, Princeton, West Virginia, stuff, a senseless, uh, senseless crime and stuff. You know, it was a... A, a well loved and known wrestling fan in the area. Um, she went to. She she was the kind of fan that that wrestlers really enjoy. Uh, she supported not only her favorite wrestlers, but you know even her not so favorite wrestlers. Uh, she came to. She was a, a frequent face at several different shows uh, in West Virginia, not just in Princeton, but in Beckley and um, you know uh, uh, Racine and then a couple other shows and stuff. And as far away as Morganton. Uh, you could see her in the crowd and stuff, and she was always, you know, she knew that uh, when the wrestlers were selling those you know, the gimmick tables and stuff, that that's what we use, you know, for hotels and gas and food. And even if she only spent five bucks or whatever, she would try to spend, you know, a couple bucks with with, with all the boys and stuff. Um, so, like I said, it, it's very sad to see that that she passed away. Um, that she her she was very sad to see that she passed away was the victim of a crime and stuff and this show is basically just to help her family out not only to let them know that that we care and that uh we miss her but also to help them out in this time of need you know um she's already been, she's already had a funeral and stuff but this is to help with the expenses that happens after somebody passes away a lot of people forget that uh just because you die your bills and your debt doesn't go away you know the rest of your family and uh your children's stuff who are still living and stuff still have to carry you on. There's still bills and, and everything on top of funeral expenses. So uh, that's what Saturday show is all about. And hopefully uh, people not only in the Princeton area, but people in West Virginia and, uh, and South or Southeastern, Southwestern Virginia, Kentucky, and maybe even Southeastern Indiana can come to the show and, and really help out and uh, show their support. Excellent. Excellent. Um, this past weekend, I was at WCWO on Friday night. Had a great show. Um, <clears throat> Saturday, it didn't do much. On Sunday, I went to the greatest spectacle in racing. Uh, me and 350,000 uh, of my closest friends uh, were at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway for the Indy 500. It was a uh, great contest. And uh, um, Alexander Rossi, a, a rookie in uh, IndyCar, was the winner. So that was uh, very exciting. We had a fun time. It's great to uh, show off Indianapolis. This coming weekend, I will be at WCWO at 1151 South Kentucky Avenue um, for WCWO, the Outlaw Arena. Uh, should be another great card. On Saturday, there's so much going on. I feel bad I have to miss a few things. Uh, Intense Championship Wrestling will be running in uh, Marion, Indiana. Lennox King will be having his first. Uh, Title defense, so it should be a great show. 
Uh, also on Saturday in Fort Wayne is Wrestling for Warriors. Uh, it's a great benefit, and the Handicapped Heroes, Rhino, uh, Mickey James are all going to be on there, so it, it should be an amazing show. I will actually be at the Ring of Honor show here in Indianapolis, Indiana. I'll be marking out, and it'll be it'll be a very good time. Uh, Will, I, we had talked about Saturday night with you. What do you got going on on Friday? Oh, man, see, I was hoping you were going to ask me about that, Zane, because Friday – I am coming back to the horrible, horrible state of Indiana. Ah. Uh. Oh, yay. <laughs> uh, no, no, seriously, I'm wrestling for Peter B.S. and Jimmy Seltzer. Uh, and me and my buddy Joe Black, uh, together with, of course, with the Sound of Fury and stuff. And, uh, we, we are taking our feud with, uh, that started in Atlanta for AWE, uh, versus Team IOU, and we're starting to take it nationwide and stuff, and the first stop outside of Georgia is going to be Indiana. So it's going to be me and Joe Black versus Team IOU in, in Evansville, Indiana. Um, and I don't know what kind of wrestling. I'm assuming, you know, because Drew Skills and Congo Kong and a lot of these guys and stuff uh, wrestle in Indiana, that Indiana may be ready for the sheer amount of brutality that's going to commence uh, Friday night. Well, that's that's rad. should be a great show. Uh that's very exciting. You're going to have a long drive from uh, Friday night to Saturday uh, from uh, Evansville down to West Virginia. Actually, I think it's only it's only like five hours. Actually, the longest part of my drive actually is from where I live at, from my house to Evansville, Indiana, which is like uh, twelve and a half, thirteen hours. Um, so you know, it's like thirteen hours to to Evansville, Indiana, and then it's five hours to Princeton, West Virginia, and then Sunday we're back in Atlanta for AWE. Um, I think we're working Team IOU Sunday. I'm not sure. Uh, that's only like a five-hour drive from from Princeton, West Virginia, to Atlanta. So uh, driving to Evansville is going to be the longest part of my weekend. Oh, awesome. Hey, um, I uh, I had mentioned earlier, given a plug to Wrestling for Warriors, and actually I just found out I am booked for that show. So I will be in Fort Wayne on Saturday uh, doing probably the biggest uh, – event that I've ever done, at least the, the most names on the card that I've ever done. I, I've introduced Drew Skills before, so this might not be the biggest, but uh, it's, it's right up there. Uh, John Cena Sr. is going to be the special guest commissioner. Uh, the Handicapped Heroes are taking on NXT stars Tommaso Ciampa and Johnny Gargano. Um, Nate Madsen versus Gavin Quinn. Um, Mickey James versus Candice LeRae. Dick Justice versus the Mysterious Movado, the Monroes versus Scarbonis, and the main event, uh, Rhino versus Ethan Page. So should be a stacked card. So I'm, I'm very honored that I'm going to be a part of that event. A lot of great talent on that show, Zane. Yeah, yeah, very excited for it. Real quick, uh, I said that there was a lot of things to talk about this week. I'll just hit on one thing real quick. I have not personally watched the Ricochet versus Will Ospreay match from New Japan, Best of the Super Juniors yet. Um, have you guys uh, uh, watched, have any of you guys watched that yet? I, I definitely did. I'm pretty sure Kev has too. Kev, did you watch it? No, actually, I've not gotten a chance to see it yet. What in the world, Kev? I'm so disappointed in you for once. Oh, Kev! Sorry, I've I, I've been totally busy working and stuff this week. Kev. I've not been I've not been able to stay up until stupid o'clock in the morning to to watch New Japan World. I have so, not seen it either. I apologize to Will Huckabee for that. So, uh, Will, what was your reaction to it? Um, I, I, knowing who, you know, Will Ospreay is and knowing who Ricochet is and knowing the, the kind of wrestlers they are, um, and knowing the styles of matches they have, uh, it was everything that I expected and more. I expected, uh, as Jim Cornette would say, I would expect a bunch of flippity dudes and kicks, uh, and, and like Ricochet had responded in kind to Jim Cornette that, he is not only a flippy do wrestler, he is the flippy do wrestler. Uh, so when the guy responds like that to Twitter, you automatically know that, you know, his matches are going to be very air- acrobatic and stuff. Um, I actually enjoyed the match. <clears throat> Excuse me. I-, I wasn't expecting, you know, 
um, Dean Malenko versus Chris Benoit or a William Regal versus Chris Benoit match because that's not the kind of wrestlers these guys are. Um, they're very high pace. They're very high pace. Um, very acrobatic, a lot of jumps and flips and dives and, and kicks and stuff, and that's what they do. And that's why fans like to see them. They're very excited and stuff. Um, the the match, would I ever do a match like that? Probably no. Um, do I like to see matches like that? Yes, I do, because it's amazing um, to see guys who can not only move the way they move, but can do it for, you know, 20 minutes at a time. Um, and, and Drew can tell you better than anybody, better than I can, it's very hard. You have to be in very good shape cardio wise to have that style of match for over five, six minutes to be able to do what they can do for 20, 25, 30 minutes uh, is a testament to the amount of time that they put not only in the gym, but on the treadmill. Um, I, I can't understand. Well, I can understand why a lot of old school guys, and, and I mean that with all due respect, um, didn't like the match. Um, there was, it was not a, a, technical masterpiece you know there was not a there were some wrist locks there were some hammer locks uh but that's not what that match was about that match was totally about the acrobats and, and showing off these guys athletic ability and stuff and, and i completely enjoyed it as much, just as much as the fans that were in uh the, the building at the time awesome awesome uh drew did you were you able to catch it no i haven't seen it okay all right you know and uh, can I something? go ahead I'm, I'm sorry, speaking of it, um, because um, our, our mutual friend, a, a huge friend of the Undisputed Wrestling Show, Sugar Dunkerton, um, made a, a comment on his social media about um, this very same match. Um, and he was talking about, you know, people want to, to badmouth stuff, you know. This is, the, this is a prime example of trying to bash a product and then having the exact, and having the exact, opposite reaction that you intended um we all heard of course the reason why we're talking about this is because vader completely dogged this match on social media um just bad mouth both the wrestlers and the match and, and everything and because of that people went out and watched the match they had to see well what is vader talking about and because of vader and if i was ricochet and, and will osprey i would probably send him a huge gift basket um because because of him, this match has gotten so much attention worldwide that New Japan had to basically release this match in its entirety on YouTube. You know, so so that's a, a an example, a prime example of you know somebody thinking that uh, their words have more power than than what they actually do, and thinking that oh, if I say this, these guys will never have another job, they'll never get work, and then they're having the complete opposite reaction. So let this be an example, uh, or the number one example for people who are saying, oh, well, I don't like this, keep your mouth shut. If you don't like something, don't talk about it, because people are going to want to see what you're talking about. Awesome, awesome. Well, you know, I, I've i just seen the end of it. I think that there's an evolution of pro wrestling, um, and, you know, I can't wait to hear Jim Cornette's take on it just because I think it'll be funny. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it, it is what it is. So, so before we call Rory Fox, I do want to let you guys know that next week we do have Ring of Honor star Jay Diesel will be joining us in the first hour. And then in the second hour, the king of status, Brayer Wellington will be joining us. So another awesome show. Uh, that, uh, we will uh, be presenting to you. Uh, and also next week, uh, I do want to discuss, I don't know if we'll be able to kick back to all of it, but uh, a lot of things happened. I want to get your guys' opinion next week about the, uh, Ricochet and Will Ospreay match, uh, that's been all talked about on the internet. We can talk more about the, uh, um, um, brand split that uh, Sign Guy had mentioned for WWE. And also, I'm very excited. I posted something on the Undisputed Wrestling Show Facebook page today about uh, there is a new Netflix show that's being commissioned from the creators of Orange is the New Black, and it's all about GLOW, Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling. So uh, we definitely have some things to talk about next week. So, uh, Killer Kev, do you want to hit our next guest, Mr. Rory Fox? Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We have with us now on the Undisputed Wrestling Show here at the Angry Marks Podcast Network. We have Rapid Fire, Rapid Delivery, also known as Roy Fargo, and also known to most 
as Roy Fox. Roy, how are you doing tonight, sir? Hey, man, I'm doing awesome. Just got back from the gym. I was hanging and banging for an hour, brother. I'm ready to go right on. Up. Right on, right on. Well, man, uh, you got started in this crazy uh, business of professional wrestling uh, in a way that a lot of people uh, have not. And then a lot of pressure put on you because your start was kind of broadcast to the world there at the, on the MTV uh, special. I want to be a pro wrestler. I know, of course, of the five-year-old who fell in love with the business and guys like uh, the British Bulldogs and Rhino, Ryan Sandberg. But if you don't mind, tell our listeners a little bit about uh, your passion for the business and, and how you got started. Well, I'd, you're, you're dead on with the uh, Ryan Sandberg and the British Bulldogs. That's, that's right up my alley there. Yeah, I was, you know, as a kid growing up, um, the small town where I'm from, we never had cable. All we had was superstars of wrestling on uh, Sunday nights. We'd get one hour a week, and I saw superstars of wrestling, and I saw the British Bulldogs, and uh, I saw them do that little double team maneuver where Davey Boy would put the guy up on his shoulders, and Dynamite would jump off his back and uh, do that flying headbutt, and I uh, saw the British Bulldogs, and that was it for me, you know. I I appreciated Hulk Hogan then, but you know I love the British Bulldogs and Ultimate Warrior, Macho Man, and Ricky Steamboat. But it was one of those where I was always a fan, but I never really thought of actually doing it until years later when I started lifting weights and then thinking I have to find out if I can do this or not. I at least have to find out. I don't want to have regrets. And uh, where I'm from, a lot of people just worked in the factory, and it's like shit. I could always go back to the factory if uh, wrestling doesn't work out or I just had to find out because I didn't want to live and watch, you know, Monday Night Raw every week. And gosh, I wish I would have tried it there. Yeah, it's been a crazy ride. For sure. Uh, Like like we talked about there for a second there with the MTV, how did that come about with them uh, doing that special and then you to getting to be a, a huge part of that? Yeah, that was... Um, that's one of those things, you know, how crazy the wrestling business is, how one guy screws up, another guy gets rewarded with an opportunity. Um, I was just one of the guys in the background there, you know, just training at the school and hoping to get a match at some point, you know, and, but yeah, like a lot of people know that Matt Taglia from Chicago, who was handpicked to, uh, do six weeks at the school and then, uh, debut in a battle Royal. And he ended up being a... being a crackhead and uh MTV had to scramble, you know, he <laughs> a little piece of yeah, little I mean, he actually head. he actually he actually pawned off his camera, you know, like back in the day with the real world and uh where you're supposed to do that private session with the camera. He, like pawned the camera off. They had to like buy the camera back. I mean he disappeared for days. He left me downtown <laughs> downtown in Cincinnati at the uh US Bank, he goes, Oh, oh, Steve, can you take me downtown there, man? We have to go to the fifth third downtown. <laughs> I was like, No, we have to go to the downtown one. It's the only one that opened. I'm not even from Watkins. I don't know the difference. And, um, we get down there around five thirty, six o'clock, and I drop him off. I'm like, Okay, go to the bank. And a half hour goes by, and he's nowhere to be found. And finally, I'm like, Damn it, we got to get back to training practice tonight. Or Les is going to have our ass, like you know what you say. I'll have your ass. Sure. Um, and I come to find out that bank was closed at 5 o'clock. So you know what he was doing downtown Cincinnati with the way that area used to look. <laughs> so yeah. I called the school, and old GQ Masters is like, I, I go, he, he looks, he didn't, where's he at? I don't know what to do. I can't find him. And it was starting to get dark. He goes, brother, you better get out of downtown and get back to the trading center, brother. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, wow. you know, the old naive kid from Iowa already got worked. <laughs> <laughs> Six months in well, training. You, you know, everybody's uh, everybody's first match is nerve wracking, and you know you got the jitters, and you're finally getting to do what you've always wanted to do. But you did that under the uh, microscope of the cameras as well. That must have been uh, stressful when you and Taxi took on uh, GQ and uh, Shadell. Oh, it was very nerve-wracking. I mean, even though I was in there with some good veterans and it was a tag team match at least, at least, but if you go back and see the footage, GQ's kind of going over the match, you know, just listen up, brother, and this and this, and I'm like, oh, can we do this, and then we can do this, and then it does, and that. You know, nervous as hell, and, 
Yeah, I mean, who else gets an opportunity like that? Your very first match is on MTV. I mean, it's crazy. I'm just, I, I'm just glad. That, I'm just very fortunate that it, they showed clips of it and it's edited down. So I was like, God, he's only been training eight months. Gosh, he's good. Well, back then, eight months was considered a long time. I mean, now it's like yeah. three months here on shows, but you know, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely changed. Definitely, uh, definitely different. I started uh, there at the same place at HWA after you did, and uh, we spent some time together there, and I was lucky enough to spend some time in the ring with you and Matt Stryker uh, in some tag matches. When you left uh, there, you went to Texas. Is that right? Kind of, kind of walk us through what happened after all that stuff. Yeah. Um, what was that? When, uh, yeah, the first – are you talking – okay, the one, after I came back to Cincinnati and then I left again? Yeah. I went, I went, yeah. Home, for, I went home for a year, got really bored, and uh, – Russell around the Midwest, and uh, I had an uncle that lived in Texas, and he's in San Antonio, and he always gave me that offer, whenever you want to calm down, just come down. And I went down to visit him, and it became almost three years down there. You, you wouldn't believe all the wrestling in Texas. Um, I was wrestling in San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, El Paso, got to go into, got to go into Mexico from time to time. Um, yeah, and it was the thing, and it, it, you know, it was always like, oh, let's see how you do outside of Ohio. Like, you can get over at HWA, but the key to good wrestlers is, is you can get over in other places. And For sure. I got over in Iowa, I got over in Minnesota, and I, I got over in Texas. Like, pretty much every promotion I wrestled for, at some point I held one of their titles. So, um, I was very pleased with Texas. I mean, the other opportunities, I mean, I wrestled Eric Young down there, I wrestled the uh, LAX, I wrestled the Naturals. Uh, I actually wrestled one time my old rival, uh, Shark Boy down there, wrestled Cassandro, uh, wrestled six man tag against the great, uh, Jerry Lynn, and I actually had a match with Honky Tonk Man. If you would have told me when I was a little kid one day you'd be wrestling Honky Tonk Man, I'd say you're out of your mind. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, I, I took the guitar shot just fine. It didn't hurt my neck like, you know, what apparently what happened to Jake, you know. But, uh, <laughs> um, and the other funny thing was, is, uh, speaking of Grace, you had him on earlier tonight, which I have the duty of trying to follow one of the, one of the legendary guys, the Bushwhacker Luke. I actually teamed with, uh, uh, this guy named Dick Dallas, and we wrestled Rudy Boy Gonzalez. You know, he's the head trainer for Shawn Michaels School, training the Dragon, and, uh, Lance Cade, and Spanky. Um, but anyway, Bushwhacker Luke and uh, Rudy Boy teamed together. And, uh, my tag partner, he was, he was on the greener side, real big guy. And, uh, when Bushwhacker Luke went to pen him at the finish, you know, the, you know, the old licks coming, <laughs> but old Luke actually slipped him the tongue in the mouth. <laughs> wow. That oh, was so great. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I had an awesome, oh, I, I didn't tell this. You guys wouldn't even believe this is I had, series of matches with Masada of all people. You see the kind of wrestling Masada does. I mean, he's yeah. an awesome wrestler, but he also does all the, the, the hardcore wrestling, violent wrestling. And, you know, we were having just standard wrestling matches and, uh, there was a great promotion in, uh, Dallas too. They're called XCW. They had weekly TV. Um, it was on before ring of honor was on that, uh, uh, before ring of honor when they, the original uh, deal they had. Um, but anyway, they had this, hardcore wrestling called XCW wrestling. And I, I won their television title and it was like, I became their face of the wrestling company there. And I was Mr. Anti hardcore wrestling. So it was, I had so much fun in Texas, but after a point, it was just time to come home, but well, great time. Yeah. I think that's really when I learned how to be a heel wrestler wrestling down there and also traveling the roads up and down with a uh, dusty wolf, Rudy boy Gonzalez and uh, Ken Johnson. But, uh, Sure. Right. See, that's the key thing. A lot of these guys, they, they don't get to go up and down the roads with old veterans. And I, I got to experience that in Texas. It was great. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, definitely changed. Definitely different. I, I met Rudy, uh, in, uh, at NWA Wildside and, uh, me and Masada teamed against, uh, Hot Stuff, uh, Hernandez and, uh, and, uh, Onyx there so yeah, yeah good guys man and, and really good guys to, to to learn from and listen to and and that that was uh that was very good and then you went back to iowa from texas is that right yeah yeah i i ended up going to des moines because it was just kind of i wanted to do something else so i was doing wrestling in uh the des moines area and western iowa and, and minnesota 
I was kind of winding things down anyway. I was kind of burnt out. I was at the point there where WWE was in a total different direction than it is right now. But I was just, I was around 35 and I just thinking it's not going to happen. I, you know, I did how many, how many extra bookings and every time, you know, this is when John Laurinaitis was still the head guy. And every time I would go, he would always pull out that cell phone and act like he's talking on it whenever I'd walk by him. I'm like, come on, man. So I knew it was up with that. It was, a, it were bookings, but it was, you want to get looked at, you want that dark match. You want to show one time what you can do. And I never really got to do that. If, if I would, if I knew then what I know now, back when Brooke and Brawler was still there, I was like, hey, Brawler, can I cut a promo for you? I had this former child actor turned to a wrestler gimmick I want to pitch. You know, I got this idea. It'd be like an equalizer for a smaller guy, but, you know, I didn't pit, I didn't offer to cut promos or bug people about promos, and that was probably a mistake. Well, you know. well, well we, this is the Undisputed Wrestling Show. We are here with Roy Fox on the Angry Marks Podcast Network, and I'm going to pass it over to the sign guy to give you a couple questions, Roy. Uh-oh, what the sign guy got for me? Well, first of all, thank you for being on the show tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, first thing I have for you is you got the chance to come in when things were just starting to change a lot in professional wrestling. Uh, there were national companies and yeah. they had a huge ratings when you were breaking in and WWE pretty much became the only really major company for a while early in your career. Do you think being a wrestler in that era, it was easier for you to be able to do what you did in your career? Or do you think that you came in in the wrong era, either too early or too late to best utilize what you bring to the table for professional wrestling? Oh, absolutely. Great question. Um, I feel I would have excelled in the 70s or 80s territories or in this era now, say if I was 25 or 30 years old, definitely. Um, but if ECW and WCW would have stayed open, I was just starting to get bookings with WCW. And I, I definitely know with my personality and my ability to get heat that I could have definitely been a, a newer version type of, of you know, a, a Chris Jericho type antagonist to work with other uh, American cruiserweights or uh, luchadors as well. I definitely think there would have been opportunities in WCW in that division. Or or even, you know, that Steve Carino type of heel in ECW if they would have stayed open. Something something of that degree, you know. Um, but, uh, yes, I definitely, it's, we you know, when we got in, there was all these places to wrestle. You thought there was always going to be an ECW. You thought there was always going to be a WCW. And that was the key thing, get over in WCW or ECW, and then WWE might finally give you a look. You know, that was the whole prototype. That was the way to do it. And, yeah, it it really sucked. Um, yeah, I wish I was 30 instead of 40. I definitely uh, – things would be a little different right now. But, but yeah, it was so funny either way. Um, I, I really don't have that many regrets. I mean, I, I fulfilled a lot of dreams and got to travel a lot of places. Very good question. And you had the opportunity, like was said earlier, to be on the MTV special and everything. Mm -hmm. MTV now is a completely different animal than it was yeah. at that point in time. Television as a whole has changed drastically. Do you think that there are still opportunities in today's television market for people that want to get into wrestling via other avenues and get seen and be known before they try to get on with a major wrestling company. You think that still exists in today's marketplace? Oh yeah. Well, yeah, I was about to say about all the wrestling companies now, but um, as far as TV shows, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know. It's probably definitely something to reality TV, but uh, otherwise, yeah, I mean, really you just, if you have a pretty good physique and you have a solid background, I mean, and you're young, I mean, you got, you have a shot at ring of honor and uh, Lucha underground and evolve wrestling. I mean, 
it's this your best way. You don't really go, need to go to the outside mainstream now. I mean, there's so many promotions now to at least get to be seen. If you have what they're looking for, there's definitely an opportunity now. Um, but as far as other outlets, yeah, I'm not sure. And I, I don't really think so. I think best bet is, is now to actually try the wrestling. And before it would have been try to get over in some other, like what Miz did, you know, he got over on MTV and got that job. But, yeah, I, I I think now is your best time to actually try to get in the wrestling business. Oh. So many, and look at look at how many Americans now get to wrestle over in New Japan. So I mean, the Indies are loaded with talent now. It's just there needs to be more veterans out there sometimes to slow them down and show them there's another way that you don't have to do everything every night. And then sometimes there's nights to do it, and sometimes not so much. Yeah, it's a good time to be in the business if you're in between 20 and 30 and then maybe, you know, so early 30s. Now, someone like yourself that came up through Les Thatcher's uh, training and someone that had the opportunity to be on MTV and you got a lot of look at uh, WWE television over the years, WCW television, like you said. Mm-hmm. Do you think that someone that's breaking in today if they don't have the same background and the same fundamentals that you had through Les Thatcher, if they were to get those looks today, do you think that they stand less of a chance not having the same talent of trainers available? Because now in wrestling, you have a lot of people training the new generation of wrestlers that aren't completely Mm -hmm. trained themselves. They aren't trained properly it's become sort of a growing problem in wrestling but Mm -hmm. when you have guys like Les Thatcher, Mr. Hughes, Harley Race, people like Mm -hmm. that training guys, you think those are the training camps that are going to produce the actual top tier talent? Yeah definitely those would be the guys more ready for TV but really now it benefits you more if you're young and green and you have a look right away WWE would prefer to have you with less skill and they can mold you in the, the type of wrestling that they want. It's easier to break what we call bad habits. Like if I would have went there, they would have, I would have had so many bad habits and already, you know, trained. but uh, it's, it's easier now. If you have a specific look they're looking for, and if you're green as grass, it's okay. It's, it's, it'll be easier to you, easier to learn their system and they don't have to, to break you, like break you in as much, you know, it's, it, it's better. I mean, it's 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 better to be green. But I mean, if you're anyway, that's what I think. But. Well, at this point, I'm going to slide you over to our other co-host, the bearded wonder Zane Paisley. Oh well, actually, I'm going to kick it over because I know Will Huckabee, uh, the Incredible Huck, has uh, has some big questions for you. So uh, I'm going to kick it over to him first. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Zane. Well, right. I, I got to ask. I, I've got to ask you this question, Rory. Um, you know, getting your quote unquote big break, being a, uh, a star of the MTV documentary and stuff, um, could be seen as having a double edged sword in a, to a lot of people. Uh, first of all, did you ever get any backlash uh, from being on that show? Um, uh, back then, it, I really, I really didn't get a lot of backlash from it. I mean, everybody was always friendly to me because. Back when back when there there wasn't all these great places to train, HWA was pretty famous as putting out fine talent. So a lot of places you would go and had that stigma. Oh, they're from HWA. They're pretty good, and uh, you know, less less trained us enough. Where we're with some uh, you know guys that are kind of you know um, greener than we are, we could still lead them, and it'd be all right. So I never really received backlash for being on the MTV thing. A lot of them were like they thought it was cool I was on the show or. I was trained by Les Thatcher, so I was all right, you know. So it definitely helped me. It didn't. It didn't hinder me so much. Maybe um, with WWE or something, they could be like, "Well, he's already been on MTV. We want to say, you know, we discovered him or we developed him." I don't. I don't know. I think that may have been a backlash because if WWE WWE wasn't with MTV yet, so I don't know. But I, I would say definitely. I I would say that. Really, I didn't receive any backlash from it that I know of. I, everywhere I went, I was treated pretty well. Now, you mentioned earlier stuff in your comments, you know, with Sangha saying, 
um, this is a great time to be in professional wrestling uh, if you're in your 20s and early 30s and stuff. But, you know, we started seeing that a lot of guys in their late 30s, 40s, uh, I'm not going to mention your names, Drew Skills, <laughs> Troy Miller, are having, um, <laughs> yeah. are, having, are having really good careers um, later on in, 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 in life, I guess you could say, for lack of a better word, uh, because of uh, recent studies about diet and nutrition and working out and everything. Um, do you think that if you would have the information that we have now about nutrition and working out and supplements and all that stuff, uh, that your career would have been a lot longer than what it is now. You would be in better shape. Uh, you would be in better shape to handle the, 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 the roughness and the bumps and bruises of being in the professional wrestling business. I don't know. I, I, I took, I took four years off. It's just when I was around 35, it's just, I just had enough. It wasn't, things weren't going anywhere. I was tired of being broke. And really, you know, if that's when you should have kept pushing away, but kept pushing on. But um, yeah, if, if it was the way things are now and I was 35, definitely I would have pursued some other things. But, no, it's great. I mean, guys in their 30s can still get tons of bookings. It's just it's hard for WWE to look at you when you're 35. They'll take you at 30, 32, and then you're on their TV at 35. But then again, there are exceptions to the rules. There's guys, you know, that like Batista and other guys. I mean, if you really improve your luck and, you know, the age doesn't matter. So, but... Uh, if you're an undersized guy like me, they're you know they're not uh, you know, they're not looking for a uh, forty year old white boys my size you know unless you got something really special about you I just you know I'm not I can't wrestle like Benoit I'm not Brian Danielson I mean I'm a real obnoxious heel that could get really over like I said that former child actor gimmick may have been my equalizer but that time's come and gone and I just I don't I just you know I don't go do enhancement stuff anymore it's just why well, put myself through all that? It's just, you know, just to get a booking. And, well, you're hello, sir. Hello, sir. Yeah. But no, there's, yeah, there's definitely that. opportunity. Yeah. Well, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead because I know our time is running very short with you. I'm going to pass it to the bearded wonder, Zane. Uh, Zane, yeah. what do you have for Rory? Well, Rory, uh, thank you so much for coming on. I, we just have just a few more minutes before our producer tells us we have to wrap up because we have yeah. uh, the impact implosion coming up. But I'm, I'm shocked that Huck didn't ask about this. I thought he was. Uh, can you, I know you talked about it on Talk is Jericho, but can you briefly talk about uh, the ECW match with the tights exploding? Yeah, and it's funny you mentioned that. Uh, I got a nice little rub today from uh, Zach Ryder. They happen to be in uh, Rockford today. So he said... He 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 he, shot, he gave me a shout out on there today. Uh, that, you know he'll never <laughs> never forget Rory Fox and the exploding tights and uh, <laughs> Rockford, Illinois. That's where they're at tonight. So yeah, my story was is he pulled my trunk so hard. If you ever seen that spot done in wrestling, you're very close to the corner, and and then uh, the heel just gently yanks those trunks, and you take a face bump. I, I wasn't even close to the corner and he was grabbing on my trunks and like taking a back bump, ripping so hard. And that's why I always thought it was a rib and I was always angry about it. And they had a really good joke about it. And I was, my feelings were really hurt because I, I was like, I'm getting buried by one of my heroes, Chris Jericho. And it was really bad, but, um, he totally made up for it. And, and this is the thing too, guys, everyone out there, uh, never take no for an answer. Or if you don't, if you don't try, you'll never know. I contacted Jericho on Twitter and I said, Hey, can I tell my side of the story? And this is when I was pretty much out of the business. Who would have thought at the end of my career, I'd be on Chris Jericho's uh, tour bus. He's on tour meeting one of my heroes and being on his podcast. So ladies and gentlemen, I tell you this, just you, if you don't try, you don't know. The worst they can say is, is no. So I'll never forget that. You know, it's, like I, I told Ryder, you know, if this wouldn't have happened, I never would have been on Talk as Jericho, and I wouldn't have been in Chris Jericho's most recent books. And <laughs> that is true. And you ju you just never know what's going to happen. I, I I was holding no. I mean, nothing came out of it. I thought maybe I had a new gimmick there. Um, I could have been the guy with the the. How many different ways could you have a wardrobe malfunction? You know, it keeps, <laughs> it keeps happening to this guy. You know, but so uh, that, that was towards the beginning of PG, and I don't know. And the other part was, is I was so scared. I didn't even want to go through the back because I thought they weren't going to be able to show it on TV. And, and, uh, 
I thought Vince is going to be furious that he's wasted. To, and and uh, Jericho said Vince laughed his ass off too, but no one bothered to smarten me up about it. They all just didn't say anything. They kind of looked at me and made me feel like an asshole. I'm sorry, <laughs> can I say that or no? Oh, oh no, you're uh, fine. You're fine. <laughs> yeah. So that, yeah, that was the rip was on me. They made me feel like an asshole, and and they they all laughed their ass off. Well. Rory Fox, Rapid Fire Rory Fox, we really appreciate you coming on with us. We definitely want to have you back on again soon because we didn't get half the story that, that we know that we can get from you. Yeah, um, I, I have some West Thatcher stories. I have some uh, WWF stories. And, uh, yeah, I'd definitely like to be on once again with Well, before we let you go, can you give our listeners uh, all your social media info so we can follow what you're up to these days? Oh, absolutely. Uh, speaking of that, uh, this Saturday I'll be at Metro Pro Wrestling in Kansas City, Kansas. It's the Turner Rec Center. It's the home of uh, the original Central States Wrestling, and Demolition's going to be on the show, and I'm wrestling Mark Sterling. Um, but you can follow me on Twitter at uh, Rory Fox underscore, and I do have a Facebook fan page as well, Rory Fox. So, And everybody in that area there, come on, I'm still looking to wrestle in Indiana and Illinois, Wisconsin, wherever you book me, I will be out there, and maybe someday I'll even team with that big nasty Drew the Don. <laughs> hey, uh, over there, you in, talk. Uh, I can talk all the shit, and you'll back it up. It'll be great. At, <laughs> at Metro Pro, uh, do you know a guy named uh, the Midnight Midnight Rose there? This will be my first time down there. They wanted me to go four years ago, but I had to say, "Well, I'm finishing things up." But uh, it'll be my first time down there. Well, if if you have any PBR or Strohs, bring one for uh, the Midnight Rose. Midnight Rose, huh? <laughs> oh, yes. and Demolition are going to be there. That's another thing about the wrestling business. When I was a little kid, I'm going to be sharing the locker room with Demolition. How cool is that? That is amazing. That is awesome. Those guys, uh, are, those guys are awesome, Do you need to say anything man. before we let them go? Yeah. Yeah, I just want to thank you for coming on, bro. Uh, greatly appreciate it. And we will definitely have you back on, man, because we could talk for forever and ever and ever. And I got to see you soon, brother. All right, man. Yeah, man. Use that stroke, man. Get me booked out there. I'm not the nice little paper boy anymore. I'm that grizzled vet that can piss everybody off. But if you pay me right, I'll be nice paper boy Rory, too, if you have to. <laughs> right on, brother. Thanks All right, again, man. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. All right. I'll talk to you again. All right, thank sure. you. Okay, thanks, bye. Uh, here in the next couple of weeks, we do have, uh, next week, we've got Ring of Honor star Jay Diesel and the King of Status, Briar Wellington. Uh, on the 21st, we've got confirmed uh, uh, three-count member and former WCW Cruiserweight champion, Evan Courageous. So, got a couple great shows coming up. Uh, before we go, uh uh, Will, what are your closing remarks? Um, support indie wrestling. Um, and not only that, but you know, I don't know. Uh, people, I guess I can say thanks, thanks everybody who wished me a happy Memorial Day yesterday. But um, Memorial Day is not for for those of us who serve the military and still alive. It's for us to remember those um first to remember our fallen comrades. You know, not only the ones that we lost, but those in the past and stuff. So. Happy Memorial Day. Well, thank you for that. Uh, Sign Guy, what do you got to go on? What do you have to say before we go? It's been another amazing show tonight. I look very much forward to having Drew as our special guest on Total Dudes tomorrow. Can't wait for that. And thanks to the fine people at NWA Blue Collar for putting on a great Piper Palooza number two. Kevin Sullivan had a seminar earlier that day. There was a huge turnout for that. He had an absolutely fantastic time in his Oregon debut. Loved the locker room. Loved the talent he got to wrestle there. So I think he will definitely be back pretty soon. And Zane, that was a Great show you got booked on Saturday. Glad they picked you to ring announce for that. That sounds like it's going to be an amazing night. Yeah, I'm very excited about it. It was very unexpected. I guess uh, uh, there was a miscommunication where they they had uh, thought that I was already on board, uh, and I, I did not know uh, that about it. So uh, I'm very excited. It should be a great time. Uh, and and also, a great you need to be a wrestler. What's that? 
Miscommunication would have been a great name for a glow wrestler. <laughs> um, now, Mr. Drew Skills is going to be the ultimate guest on Total Dudes with Sign Guy and Rex. But another guy that you need to get booked uh, based off of Trip Cassidy's conversation, you need to get Ace Perry booked because uh, it sounds like he's a huge fan. Well, I'm a big fan of Ace Perry, so I definitely think we should make that happen, too. Excellent. Excellent. All right, we want to give a big special thanks to uh, producer Killa Kev uh, for uh, Drew Skills, for Sign Guy, for the incredible Huck, Will Huckabee. This is the Beer Wonders, Zane Paisley. Have a great week. We'll talk to you next week. Yeah.